Well, today marks the beginning of what we call the Advent season, and we're beginning a brand new sermon series for the weeks of Advent, these four weeks leading up to Christmas. So I want to give a special shout out and hello to all of our campuses, to those of you at our Mill Creek campus, at our South Street campus, and at our newest North Aurora campus. We're praying for you. We're excited to share this Advent season together. We launch into a series called Carols of the King. Before we get into what that means, let me ask you a question. When you were a kid, did you ever play an imaginary game about time travel? Uh, anybody imagine like going back in time? Of course, most, most of us have done that at one time or another. What would it be like to go back in time to, you know, the, the fr American frontier in the West or to, you know, the mi Middle Ages and knights in shiny armor kind of thing? Or maybe you w w read a book like I would do and imagine what would it be like to go into that time period? Or I often, driving across the country, would think, what was this place like 200 years ago? And so I can't help, <laughs> frankly, I think I still play that game in my own mind as an adult. But we're going to play a bit of that game in our minds as we launch into this new series and go back 2,000 plus years and imagine what was it like to be among the people of Israel uh, in the time just before Jesus was born, in the first century, or the, very, the very beginning of that first century AD. What was that like? What would it be like? What were the people of God thinking about? What were they talking about? What were their expectations? What was the sort of the ethos in the culture? of that day. It's actually not that hard for us to imagine because both the later prophets in the Old Testament and the Gospels in the New Testament give us some very clear indications of what it was like, what the people of God were thinking about and expecting and hoping for. Uh, one thing we can tell is that in some ways their life was not all that different from ours. There were political divisions, there were racial tensions, there were economic disparities. There was oppression uh, of people. There were the poor being exploited. There was disease. There was death facing their own mortality. There was uh, abuses of power and rulers that never lived up to their promise. I mean, we can all relate to those things, even though the, we're separated by the centuries. But the one thing I think we would notice for sure was there would be a sense of collective, collective expectation a communal sense of longing or anticipation for God to act, for God, Yahweh, to do something, to break in, for, specifically for Messiah to come. That would have permeated the culture, the conversations, the, the ethos or atmosphere of the day. They were waiting for God to come, waiting, we're told, in the dark, waiting in 400 years of prophetic silence, the dark of 400 years of no word from God, no prophet speaking, waiting in the dark of continual occupiers and oppressors, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, and at this time, the Romans. The history of Israel is a history of a captive, occupied people. And they would have been waiting for God to speak in the midst of this darkness. Fleming Rutledge has a beautiful list of sermons uh, for Advent. In, in the beginning, the initial sermon is called Advent Begins in the Dark. Let me read an excerpt from it for you. She says, every year for followers of Jesus, Advent begins in the dark. The more the world outside lights its trees, the more they sparkle and glitter and throws about, the more it sings, have yourself a merry little Christmas, the more we should immerse ourselves in this special mood of Advent waiting. Advent comes from the Latin word adventus, meaning uh, beginnings or uh, coming or arrival. And it's the season in which Christians have immersed ourselves into this same spirit of waiting, of longing for God to act. We join ourselves, in a sense, with Zechariah, with Elizabeth, with all of the faithful people of God in that time, longing for God to come. And that's what we're going to do in this series. So I want to uh, give you a little image that will help us capture, as we look back, in order to look forward, what, what, where it is that we position ourselves in the story of God. So we'll draw it here. Advent, of course, we look back to the first coming of Jesus. And of course, at that time, they're looking forward. He has not yet come. But we now look, they're looking back, forward, excuse me, is our looking backward. So we look backward in wonder and in awe and in worship at the first advent. But we also, during this season, look forward to what we could call the second advent. Maybe you didn't know there were two, but there are. 
There's the first coming of Jesus, and then there's his return. The second advent of Jesus. Well, he, will, he will return and come again. It'll be very different than the first advent. He'll come, he first came in humility, and then he'll come again in power and glory. And when Jesus returns, it will not be in a manger in obscurity. It'll be with power and glory and wonder and awe to restore all things. So we live, in a sense, between the two advents. We look back in history with wonder and gratitude, and we look forward in expectant hope of what God will do between God's first coming and his second coming. And that's where we find ourselves for the next four weeks in this series. Now, our cultural celebrations this season are really nothing at all like Advent. We want to skip all the waiting. We want to get right to the glitz and the glitter. Starbucks brings their Christmas cups out really early. Hallmark never stops producing Christmas movies. The season gets earlier and earlier. We want to jump right to the lights and the tinsel and the glitter and the joy, joyous sounds and the happiness of it all. We sing. You can even hear it in the songs we sing. Santa Claus is coming ta to town versus Silent Night. What could be more different? And that's really the heart of our series, Carols of the King. What we're going to do is look at the four great hymns of Advent. And, the, and really more than just the hymns, the biblical and scriptural and prophetic references that they're based on, to get ourselves into the spirit of looking back in order to look forward with expectant longing for what God will do. This is the focus of our series. It's my hope that our hearts are filled with wonder and gratitude as we look backward, with hope and expectation to look forward, and that we never sing these songs the same way again. The first song is one that captures the very spirit of Advent beautifully. It's the great hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's an ancient hymn, originally a, a seven-verse poem that dates back to the 8th century. It's reinterpreted uh, in the 13th century when we, in the form we sing it now with five verses happened in the 19th century. So it goes way back. And it wasn't put to music until the 19th century. And what's amazing about this is that each verse begins with a, t a messianic title, a name of Jesus that's rooted in the Old Testament, and it gives us hope for the future. So let's work our way through the first verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the very first verse. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Boy, those four lines is just it's captured the spirit of Advent. O come, Emmanuel, God with us, and ransom us, because we're captive. We mourn in lonely exile until God appears. This verse has ancient Israel in mind. Captivity, as I said, is part of Israel's history. Whether it was Egypt or Babylon or Syria or Rome, the, the God's people had always battled foreign captors or oppressors. So it's specifically referencing ancient Israel in captivity in Egypt, but also their, their physical captivity is the result of their spiritual rebellion. And the same thing is true today. We too are ca held captive by our own spiritual rebellion against God. Captives, slaves to our sin, the Bible says. And we need someone to set us free, to ransom us. Last week we looked at Mark chapter 10, verse 45, which told us this very thing. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You ever feel like you're being held captive? You ever feel like your, your life is stuck or you're enslaved to your own thoughts, to your own anxieties, to your own worries, that you can't get out of this rut that you're in, and, and no matter how hard you try to be better, you can't fix whatever it is? I think we've all had experiences like that. The very center and heart of the hymn is the name Emmanuel, which is God's solution to our captivity. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord God to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, by the way, you see the name Emmanuel there with an I. That's the version of the Hebrew word. We sing it with an E. That's the version of the Greek word. It means the same thing. The literal meaning of the word is God with us. 
That's what Emmanuel means. In fact, we see this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is quoting from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, speaking that God is with us. So our captivity, what's the solution? God himself is the solution. That he comes, Emmanuel, to be with us. At the very center of Israel's longing was for God to come and to be with them. And you know what? I think that's at the center of our longing as well. What we need. Even if we don't know how to name it, even if we don't place it right, every human heart is longing to know that God exists, that God cares, and that God is near. That there is a God who knows me and cares for me and comes near to me. Even if we're looking for that in some place that we don't know how to name that longing, that's what it is. The longing for Emmanuel. Isaiah 41, verse 10. It's a, word that, it's a verse that's been encouraging to me over the years. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. I, you know, I think the, the simple name, Emmanuel, God with us, may be the most encouraging words in all the world. God with you, with me, with us. That's, if we could go back in time, what the people of God were longing for. Is God with us? That's what we are, some 2,000 plus years later, longing for. The nearness of God. The name Emmanuel shouts, God is near. God has come near. Not only spiritually with us, but physically. The incarnation, that he's with us. That he's close to us. It's all too easy for us to doubt that God is near. That God's with us. I don't know about you, but I, I frequently struggle with that. I, mean, I know intellectually that God is close, but I don't always feel that, do you? Well, the incarnation tells us that God's nearness is not just a th theoretical. It's not abstract. It's physical, tangible, and real. He came into our world, became one of us, took on flesh. That's what the word incarnation means. And what's amazing about this, if you know the biblical story, in Genesis 3, in the garden, the result of sin is separation from God. We're, we're removed from his presence because of our sin. The incarnation is God setting back right what was lost in Genesis 3, coming near to us, closing the gap, if you will, between himself and humanity, to reunite people to God. J.I. Packer writes about this, the incarnation is by far the most amazing miracle in the whole Bible. The fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become man and join himself to human nature will remain forever the most profound and wonderful mystery in the universe. I have a good friend who's a pastor, and we debate whether, what's the greater miracle. Is it the resurrection? I mean, come on, come on coming back from the dead is pretty good. Or is it the incarnation? His argument, and I think he's probably right, is there is no resurrection without the incarnation. It's God, God of the universe, by whom all things consist, took on flesh, became a helpless babe, became one of us, entered into our world. And by the way, this is only astounding if you have your view of God and yourself accurate. If your view of God is too small, then the incarnation is not all that remarkable. I mean, think about the Greek gods were you know, slightly more powerful than men and women. That they, they, took, they came and went and took on the form of human beings. And, you know, it, it's interesting, but it's not overwhelming. If your, God, if, if your idea of God is that he's, you know, is too small, then taking on flesh is maybe historically interesting, but not overwhelming, not astounding, not fall on your face in worship. On the other hand, if your view of yourself is too big, then, uh, then the incarnation is not all that necessary. If you see yourself as too important and too powerful and, you know, better than you actually are, then you don't need God to enter into your world. But if you understand your desperate situation, lonely exile here because of sin, held captive, and you understand we're talking about the God of the universe, then the incarnation is overwhelming to think about. This incredible miracle of the incarnation came with relatively little fanfare, if you think about it, in the first century for playing our little time travel game, very few people even noticed. Most missed it. But Emmanuel came nevertheless, and the world has never been the same. 
Let's look at the second verse. And by the way, I know it's only one verse. We're going to move faster. We're not covering every, all, all seven verses uh, from the ancient poem. Verse 2. O come thou day spring, come and cheer. That's the next name of Messiah. Our spirits by thine advent, meaning the arrival, here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. It's beautiful poetry, but what's going on here? Dayspring comes from a prophecy made by Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, who was a priest in Israel in the early first century. And he speaks about his son John being the one who would come before Messiah to, to prepare the way for Messiah. In Luke chapter 1, verses 76 through 79, this is Zechariah speaking about John the Baptist and Jesus. And you, child, meaning John the Baptist, will be called prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord, Jesus, to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This word sunrise is the same root word for day spring or dawn, uh, that the light of heaven. This is the continual imagery of the Messiah, that light of heaven has dawned, has broken into the darkness of our world, full of sin and death and suffering and evil. Come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by your arrival, advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, chase away the gloom and the darkness and, and that put death's dark shadows to flight. Only Jesus can do that. In fact, this, what Zechariah is speaking about here, the, the day spring and the sunrise, is referencing what, what we're told in the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in the famous uh, uh, chapter 9, the, the, the Advent hymn or, or uh, chapter of his prophecy. The people who walked in darkness, who walked in darkness, have seen a great light on those who dwelled in a land of deep darkness. On them, light has shone, has light shone. Who walked in darkness? Who are those people? Well, specifically speaking, the rebellious uh, children of Israel that were, uh, had, because of their own sin rebellion, they'd lost their way. They were spiritually, morally in darkness. They needed light. And we too fumble around and stumble around in the dark, looking for our way, trying to find uh, the light switch, but we can't. Someone else must, quote unquote, Turn the lights on for us. And that's the meaning of Emmanuel. Day spring, sunrise, dawn has come. Jesus, by coming to be with us, has turned the lights on. And by him we see. C.S. Lewis famously said, uh, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. The light of Christ not only shows us him, but illumines our whole life and the world, restructures re and re uh, reorients our value system. We see life differently because of the light of his gospel. We are the people walking in darkness, in other words. And Emmanuel has turned the lights on. Years ago, I took a trip to Ecuador. The very first trip our, our, we ever took there with youth ministry. I was a high school pastor in those days. We did, um, it was the first group of students to go there. We stayed on the property called El Refugio. And now it's a beautiful, amazing Christian camp. But at this time, they didn't even own the property yet. And we camped at almost 10,500 feet in this, uh, on the top of the ridge of this property. Uh, and looking down to uh, several thousand feet to the valley below. A bunch of high school students slept in sleeping bags in our tents up there. And I remember getting up at way before uh, dawn with a couple of students and sitting there together under our blankets with our sleeping bags wrapped around us in the dark, just waiting for the light to dawn, just waiting, looking down. And you could see, as the, before you could see the sun, you could see the light, it just began, the light began to change. You could see clouds below us in the valley. And then as the sun rose over the mountain in the distance, it was just a glorious moment. I'll never forget it, watching that sunrise in, in that, from that perspective. There's a sense in which I, this is the image we're given. People in darkness, waiting, waiting, hoping, looking for light to come. And he has. He has dawned in us and on us. Let's look at verse 4. This is a very a fascinating verse. O come thou, rod of Jesse. That's the next messianic title. Free thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save. And give them victory or the grave. What does the rod of Jesse mean? What are we singing about when we sing this song, O come thou rod of Jesse, free? 
Rod of Jesse, shoot, branch, offshoot of Jesse. That's what the word rod means. It means um, branch or shoot coming off of a stump or the root, as it were. This is an Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah again. Isaiah is rich in Messianic prophecy. We read at Christmas or Advent time. 11 verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. That's what it means. That's what the rod of Jesse is referring to. Now, who is Jesse? Jesse was King David's father in the Old Testament, Israel's greatest king. And we're told that the Messiah would be from the house and the line of David. So he's going to come from that line. And Joseph is from the house and line of David. So according to his earthly father, Jesus is born into a family that has that lineage. Look, look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. This is what we're told about David's throne. And your house and your kingdom, that is David's, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the prophecy to David. God's covenant with David is your throne's going to last forever. How's that going to happen? David is dead and gone. By this one who would come off that branch. By this ruler and king who would be born, who would live and reign forever. Once more, we go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal, that is the passion of God, of the Lord of hosts will do this. So we're, we sing this song, O come thou rod of Jesse free. What are we talking about? We're talking about this ancient prophecy. The covenant God made with King David, your throne will never end. But David is dead and gone. How's that going to happen? Isaiah tells us that someday one from that line would be born and establish his throne and uphold it forever with perfect justice and perfect righteousness. And that's in the song we sing. Free us from the tyranny, the oppression, the darkness, the captivity that we experience in this life. And the last enemy is death. Triumph or the grave, we sing. Give us victory or the grave. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible calls death the last enemy. I've done many funerals, and I've been around people who have hope in Christ, and they still grieve terribly, but when they're staring at the grave, the loss of a loved one, they're not staring at the abyss. They know that it's not the final word. Death may be the last enemy in this life, the great fear that looms over all of us. And many of us have come closer to that throughout this pandemic than we had previously. We're, we're all faced with our mortality in a way maybe we weren't as conscious of before. But it's true for all of us. And what we're told is when we sing about Emmanuel, he gives us victory over the grave. That is not the final word Personally, I really long for a king and a leader and a ruler who could lead this way, who could establish justice and righteousness forever. I'm weary of earthly rulers who overpromise and underdeliver. Every election cycle, we get worked up and we get excited and we, get, we think that we believe the promises they all make, and it never comes true. And it never will. It never has throughout human history. Our nation, like every nation on earth, is starving for a truly righteous king. And there's only one. Emmanuel. We remember, we are living between the advents. We are living between the time when Christ has come and he will return. He has come. We look back in gratitude and wonder at the incarnation, but he's not here yet fully. He will return and fully establish his kingdom. And we live in between, and the in between means there's brokenness, there's sorrow, there's grief, there's oppression and evil and injustice. There are evidences that he's not, that we question his reign. It's not an easy thing to live between the advents. Nevertheless, he is Emmanuel, God with us, in between. So what, what do we take from all this? We could go on, look at each verse of the, of the song, but that would take more time than we have. What do we take away from all this? What are we supposed to do with this, this advent season? Well, let's go back once more to the drawing and see if we can make some sense of it. We are located in between the Advents. And we wonder, well, what are we supposed to do? What is it we're called to do? How do we live between the Advents? Well, do you know, the great hymn we're studying and looking at actually tells us. 
there's, after every verse, there's this simple refrain which we sing. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. Now, the way we sing it sounds like Emmanuel's rejoicing, but that's not what it's saying. Rejoice, you people of God, Israel, the people of God, because Emmanuel has come to you, is coming to you, has come to you. So what do we do? What does it mean for us? Well, we look back in gratitude and wonder. We look forward in hope. And in between, we rejoice. We are to be people that are rejoicing. That's how we live in between the Advents. That's what it means for us to live in between the Advents, to rejoice. In fact, let's go back to our verses and see that last stanza, that last the refrain once more. The, the, we sing this in between, and if you think about the rhythm of the song, there's these pensive, longing verses for what God, we long for him to do. And then there's this burst of joy, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Then there's this verse about our longing, and this burst of joy. And that's kind of like our lives, it's really beautifully written. The mystery and wonder of the Christian life, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, is that we are sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And we feel that even in this song. I love the word joy. It's my wife's middle name. We like it so much it's our daughter's middle name as well. And it, 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 it evokes something. I'm a fan of C.S. Lewis's writing, which many of you know about, and he writes about joy, not as happiness, but as a longing for something, for God. Ultimately, for our joy to have any real substance, any lasting value, it has to be located in Emmanuel, in Jesus. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 35, verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord, there's that word again, the ransomed of the Lord, shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The ransomed of the Lord, that's you and that's me, that's the church, that's those, those who belong to him, shall come to Zion, to God's holy place, with singing, with joy, rejoicing. Isaiah 65, verses 17 and 18 puts it this way, For behold, I create a new heavens and new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I, recreate, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. This is looking forward to the second advent. We look back and wonder. We look forward and hope. Behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. And so we come with glad rejoicing forever. The last uh, verse of the hymn at least for our purposes, is, O come, desire of nations bind, all peoples in one heart and mind, bid envy, strife, and quarrels cease. Fill the whole world with heaven's peace. How we need that today. Just reading that, we need that today. Desire of nations. The United States of America, every nation on earth. Our desire, though we do not always know it or name it, and sometimes we resist it, is Emmanuel, to know that God is with us, that he would come to us, not because of our nation, because of, we are people redeemed by his grace and love, regardless of our nationality. He is the desire of all nations, and by the way, the word nation there, it doesn't mean what we think of it like a nation state, it means peoples, different peoples of the earth. Come desire of nations, bind us, right? Get rid of all the quarrels and the envy and the strife, only you can do that. We can't seem to manage to do that, despite all our advances. Only God with us can do that. So rejoice, rejoice. Why? Not because the commercialized Christmas season has come. That will go quickly. In fact, one of the things I want you to remember, a month from now, a little over a month from now, when you're taking down the lights and it's all over, you can still rejoice because Emmanuel is still with you. God has still come. I'll finish with a quote from, you probably can guess, my favorite author, C.S. Lewis, in his classic uh, work, Mere Christianity, which began, by the way, as a series of radio broadcast talks to give hope to people in, in, in World War II, facing fear and darkness and gloom and uncertainty. And here's what he writes in, in, in this, this passage. If you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, 
peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. They are a great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you are close to it, the spray will let you. If you are not, you will remain dry. You want joy this Advent season? You want to truly rejoice and live between the Advents properly? Draw close to Emmanuel. He alone has what you're looking for. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this ancient hymn. May we never sing it the same way again. May each time we sing these stanzas which contain these amazing names of you, our Messiah, may our hearts be filled with wonder and awe and expectant hope and joy. Teach us as we live between the Advents to be people who are rejoicing because of who you are, God, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Amen.